up? My name is Tayshawn Nolan. Thank you for tuning in to the podcast. This right here is... What's up? What's up? Ernest LaRoche in the building. It's about to go down. So right now, um, we're in Toronto and we got Ernest. He's from Montreal. So he's going to come here and share his story and let him know how it took a turn to come over here to the city. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's a different vibe coming here, you know. Everything possible is happening in Toronto, you know, so... I'm trying to take advantage of that and, you know, open my mind up and uh, come to the real city. Hmm. So how did it, how did you end up coming down to the city of Toronto? And how was it like being in Montreal? I know that you ended up going off to Division One right out of high school. And that's big for people in Toronto and being from Montreal. We don't really know very much of people outside our city doing stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I didn't go straight out of high school. I went to CJEP. Okay. Because in Montreal, you go to school till 11th grade. Mm -hmm. And then you go to CJEP, you do 12 and 13. You know? mm -hmm. So I went to uh, CJEP, and uh, then I was uh, recruited by a couple teams. And then I chose uh, New Mexico State, you know. Um, the thing with uh, Montreal and Toronto, we knew about the guys from Toronto. Mm -hmm. But the other way around, I feel like... Uh, Y'all don't really know about us, so. But there's a lot of talent in Montreal, and you know, I just want to highlight that and show people that Montreal can do it big. It's just we just speak French. That's it. That's the only difference. That's the only difference. Same population, same you know mindset. Everybody trying to grind, but the opportunity are here. You know, I feel like uh, with the Raptors, y'all don't see it, but it's a big, big advantage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. When I met you, I was actually seeing Anthony Otley. And when I got connected with him, him being able to be one of the guys to go out overseas and play pro, and just seeing what he did and the turn that he took, even playing down here in the Canadian League, and then connecting with you and hearing about your story, I got to see someone who really fit into the idea I had with my documentary that I'm doing with Michael Bongo. And it's more than just basketball, that documentary. It's a, it's a, a movie where kids, youth can really just be inspired to do what they love and mm -hmm. further it, further it through their education, further it through whether they're doing entrepreneurship, you know, whether they're entrepreneurs and innovators that's really going to change the city. So what I'm seeing with everything that's happening is this documentary is tying in to what's relevant today and bringing you along on it your story really matches up with the vision and the direction that I'm going with. Yeah, of course. Um, you know, um, basketball is like an avenue. It brings you to places like you would never think you would go, you know. And, you know, with basketball, it made me graduate from college. That's I right, got a degree yeah. from that, and I, I'm thankful that I used basketball, and they didn't basketball, I didn't let basketball use me, you know, in a That's way. That's right. So, you know, me being here, I want to show people that they can reach their dream and anything's possible, you know, through, it doesn't have to be basketball, it could be like education, it could be entrepreneur, it could be in music, it could be in science, you know, I, I really want to push that idea to the kids that y'all can do whatever y'all want, you know, mm -hmm. especially nowadays, everything is ac accessible, you know, mm -hmm. and you know, I just want to put that idea out there to the kids and help them as much as possible, be a mentor, mm -hmm. because that's one thing that, you know, uh, minority kids need, you know, especially in Toronto. Everything is expensive, so you know your parents got to work. Sometimes here in Toronto, people work two, three jobs. Mm -hmm. So now the kids is by himself. Mm -hmm. So now it's people like us that can come and intervene and kind of like school them and show them their way and show them the right way, you know, how to be a productive uh, citizen in Toronto and Canada. You know? Yeah, so what's happening in Toronto is this really isn't the same city today that I grew up in when I was in high school. And one of the reasons why I say that is because of the initiative that this group of young men have that's called the Kickback. And you got an introduction towards that when you went out and I introduced you to Christian and the people that are organizing the programs that are happening in the downtown area. 
and them bringing a bunch of kids and giving them free basketball training with a professional, that's something that I never had. And for you to come there and show your face, it, that showed me that, okay, this really was the right person to add into my documentary because I see Michael Bongo contributes back by going down to Blake Street when he's off and just seeing everyone and more than just wanting the typical things that people want, fame, people want all the attention to be on them aside from them using their outlets and the opportunities and resources that they have to give back to the community and to better other people's lives. And for me, you know, I was really self-centered until last year I got saved and me seeing what Christ did in my life, it made me do a, a 180 turn mm -hmm. and see things from the complete other side. So when I see people like you and what you're doing and then I see your background and how to see your family coming from a Christian background and the morals that they have are installed into you, that inspires me. And that makes me ask questions, you know, what did you do during those years while you were in college to stay focused to, to be starting every single year? And you were just able to add greatness into every aspect when, for your college career, for your pro career. And I'm currently in college. So, like, what would you say for people that are, that are trying to walk in your shoes? What advice would you have for them? Just work hard. That's number one, you know. When, um, you know, with Kobe passing, you know, the man, ba the man by mentality, that's uh, something that every one of us should have, you know, should mm -hmm. strive for something and, you know, see the bigger picture. Because nothing in life is given. You got to take it. You got to work hard for it. And it, you got to be patient, too, because... You know the, the the success story don't happen instantly. You know, it takes time. Sometimes, like you're gonna fall, you gotta get back up. You're gonna fall, you gonna you gotta get back up. So, being resilient also is a good uh, value to have. You know, because <clears throat> you see, you know, a lot of people, you know, fail before they really make it. Yeah, that's and, right. You know, that's right. You know, me being from Haiti. Uh, I saw things, you know, that, you know, a human being shouldn't be seen. And I see them still have a smile on their face and still, like, grinding every day. And we in Canada, so I feel like there's more uh, opportunity for you to, to have a smile in your face. That's right. You know? And, you know, what I tell the people is, me, when I got to New Mexico State, it wasn't easy you know there was three point guard we were th there were three point guard in the roster really you know? yeah two american one from la and one from baltimore yeah and you know it was a grind when i got there i was the skinniest i was the fastest but i wasn't a skilled one or anything so at first you know we were playing five on five i would get picked last on all of them and i was this french kid you know yeah <laughs> Yeah. So at the time they didn't know nothing about Canada, so it was like, you know, it was a grind every day. So so that was a challenge that you faced, huh? Yeah, it yeah. was a challenge that people don't know, but you know, me and my uh, one of my teammates, he was from Senegal, and you know, every night we would go back to the gym and get mm -hmm. like extra reps, mm -hmm. shooting, and so people they didn't know I was getting better, but I was getting better at night while you know they were doing other things and yeah. I had one goal, it was to, you know, be the best player I could I could be and to not come back to Montreal, you know, because a lot of people, they go to college and then they transfer or they come back home. And that was something that I put in my mind that I was going to stick it out, you know. Mm -hmm. So just being resilient. So after that one month of going at night and stuff like that, I started getting better, started, like, fitting in, you know. The first month, I wasn't hanging out with the team, like, I wasn't hanging out with other African people in the school, you know, because for me, you know, being from Montreal, coming to Toronto, you know, the black people got, they come from somewhere, you know, they come from the Caribbean or Africa. And that was my first time being with like other blacks that 
uh, okay. that didn't have a background that was a straight African American, you know. Yeah. So they yeah. couldn't. They didn't. They, they, they didn't know their roots. Yeah, they didn't know their roots, yeah. and I, like me, I eat rice and beans and rice and you know plantains. They don't. They didn't know nothing about that. <laughs> They would eat some food and, yeah. you know, so yeah. for me it was like, you know, I would be like, man, so food ain't that good. And then they're looking at me like, man, you're not black. Yeah. And then I'm like, bro, I am black, you know. So, so yeah, so it was just mm-hmm. different for me at first. And then I adjusted. And then, you know, after that first month, they start calling me to parties. They started, like, hanging out with me. They started picking me. And the first one on teams, you know, so that was like a turn of event. And then I started off just being a beast on defense. I would pick up 94 feet and just be a nightmare to, like, other point guards. That's how I got my minute. They're like, oh, he got, you know, unlimited defense. He doesn't really try mm-hmm. to do too much. Mm-hmm. And he's helping the team because we had great players on my team, um, you know, we had a uh, Jamar Young. Mm-hmm. You know, should have been drafted. Uh, did a couple workouts with teams in the NBA. Um, Jonathan Gibson, one of the fastest guard ever from Los Angeles. Wow. He played at uh, he played many years in Europe, and then he got finally a call to go play for Boston Celtics, and then mm-hmm. he played for Dallas Mavericks. So he played like three years in the NBA. Yeah. And uh, he's currently in China. This is one of my good friends. And he really took me as a, a little brother. And, you know, every time I go to Los Angeles, I meet up with him. And he's like family. He's really family. He's really somebody that, you know, uh, made me believe that, you know, I belong there. That's right. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. My initiative is to help other community and to draw everyone in to my headspace, seeing things from an entirely different perspective. My business is we provide basketball training for kids and pro athletes. Coming up this summer in 2020, we got the Masterpiece Project, a community in Rexdale that does arts programming. Kids can learn how to make websites, they can learn how to do videography, graphic designing, stepping them into the content creation world. Do you feel like it's more than just the fact you can hoop that separates you, or do you feel like that's something that you bring to the table everywhere you go? It's something I uh, bring to the table, you know. It, it doesn't define me, but being a, an athlete, Yes, it gives you a lot of quality qualities, and so I take that with me. It gave me discipline. It gave me like, um, you know, uh, being on time, working with like others. It gave me those those qualities that yeah. you know I, I bring that to me everywhere I go. You know, so yeah. but you know I, I think that more than that, you know, and I wouldn't just say I'm just a basketball player because I'm more than that, you know. And, uh, yeah, so that doesn't define me. It's just a part of me, like, you know, just me being a human being, being from Montreal. I feel like, you know, that taught me a lot, you know. And basketball also taught me a lot, but, you know, it doesn't define me. Well, what What is it that makes you different? Like, what makes you more than just a basketball player? You know, I went to school, I studied, I got, I got my degree. You know, I'm really, that's something that people don't really talk about or ask me. Yeah. But some, as, it's something I'm really proud of, you know, just yeah. graduating college. That's something that, yeah. you know, if you check the numbers, not everybody got a degree, you know. And I want to say that was one of my biggest accomplishments, you know. I, um, what degree did you get and why did you go for that degree? I got a degree in government. Uh, international relation. Yeah. Um, you know, I was always interested in helping out and, you know, working for an NGO, helping Haiti, helping, you know, um, third world countries, you know, and I thought I was, I was going to bring a fresh air and not mm-hmm. what they show on TV, but really be on the ground and work with the people and really bring change because there's a lot of NGOs in the world and you see those places and you don't really see a change, you know? That's right. So you, so what you want to do is you want to really bring a change to what you're doing. And you want to, I guess that you're seeing something from your lens that people aren't seeing. Yeah, like the way they, they like the NGO do things, I feel like it's not the right way. 
the n- FLID. Name one. Name one thing. Let's say, for example, in Haiti, there was an earthquake in 2010. Yeah. And all the NGOs collected millions, and nothing really was built. Nothing really was, you know, done. So I feel like, you know, those foreigners that go there, they're not really there for the people. They they're there for themselves, for their pockets. You know. Okay. So, okay. you know, and you got those places that have the most NGOs and this is the, the place that have the, wor- the the least stuff done. So okay. something is wrong somewhere, you know, but nobody's talking about it. But we're here to talk the truth. Yeah. You know, so we just pointed that out. So that's why, like, you know, I studied that, but I'm like, I got to find another way to reach people, to help people, you know. So there's so much different mediums for you to reach people and so many different alternatives for you to be able to have them move on the hearts of people. So I see what you're saying. I felt that one step that I was taking was being able to share my thoughts with other people, but also allowing them to pour themselves on me and lay who they were on myself and being humble to hear everyone else's story and trying to understand people more, mm-hmm. making myself less because I know that there is really is a greater God in me and that the people that are before me that's what it's really all about you know people aren't a nuisance to me and you know they used to be and I'm learning the value of someone in front of me is more valuable than having a million dollars in front of me because that's a human that's a life right in front of me so me having to open my eyes and see something from a new perspective Mm -hmm. is refreshing and that makes me want to get involved more with what's happening in Toronto. Like mm-hmm. saying with the kickback, what's going on with Up. Mm-hmm. And even what you're doing, you're inspiring kids through basketball. I'm looking towards doing more programming and being able to even work with the Rexdale Community Center, working within that facility and seeing how I can have a space to be able to help kids. The city is involved and they want to see things happen. They just need the right pieces. And it's just about who's willing to do something for Mm themselves so they can be put on a platform to be able to help other people. And uh, how was it growing up in Toronto? What what made you really, like, want to help, you know? What did you see that you're like, okay, you need to be involved in helping others? So the thing was, was me growing up, I always felt like the victim. Mm -hmm. And me feeling that way... I catered only towards the things that I felt were going to benefit Tayshawn. It wasn't about other people. Even when I got help from, even when I got opportunity to help other people, mm-hmm. it was for myself. Everything was centered around me in terms of the intention. What happened was it was the interactions, the encounters, and the people that were put into my life that began to start sprinkling little clean water on me they started to, you know they they put clean spots in that dark place inside of my heart mm-hmm. and like I said that encounter I had last year of me being able to see the fullness of myself you know from my creator was it just changed everything and it showed me it gave me light in that very dark tunnel mm-hmm. so now when I look out I don't see myself as a person that's in need anymore. I see myself as a person that can give because I was given. I can have grace because I was given grace. I can love because I am loved. And I can share every single thing that was given to me because I actually have those things. And it's not that people aren't loved. It's not that people don't have something to give. Mm -hmm. But it's the perspective that we have on ourselves, on life. Some people think that everything's always against them, so they're against everyone. But if people can see that, man, God is really there, and he'll take care of me, then if he's taking care of me, I can I can start focusing more on how I can make that sunshine, you know, reach out and, and broaden my horizons and be before so much other people. 
And I would just say that God gave you, um, helped you on the basketball court. How do you feel now having God in uh, your heart, in your, you know, presence on the basketball court? I would say in terms of basketball, that's something I'm, I'm still going through the process of at this time. And I feel that God is putting a lot of people in my life, like yourself, for me to be able to compete with. Last year, it was just, I had, I'm grateful for the people that are in my life and being able to go out to quality care and get that high quality level training. But this year, I don't have only one person to go to. I have, I still have my, my trainers. I have the door opened. You know, Bobby Allen opened his door to me. He was the leading scorer on Team Canada in the 90s. I have you, you're a person, and you know you haven't spoken about it up until now, but you know you average like 15, 16 points at pro. My other friend um, came out with a five-year pro, and then I can add like six more people to that list of people that are just opening their arms to me, and I'm grateful for that. So me being able to learn from every single person and all these things that happen in a short period of time, it's like I met all these people in a few months. And the relationships, they feel like I've known you know, you and other people for years now. And to me, that's God putting me in an environment that's healthy around positive people, talented people, and people that can help me grow because when I got in the gym with you, I'm seeing what it means to be a pro. And now I'm starting to think the game more. So it wasn't that I never had issues in terms of my dribbling, my speed, or my explosiveness. I had issues with putting it all together. And even just playing one-on-one -on -one or doing the drills you're doing, seeing your demeanor, your body language, I'm able to copy and paste it for myself. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> and it and it works. It makes me better. So I would say God does things in so much different ways. He graces people to be able to perform for what he desires them to do. And he also puts them around the right people for them and the right situations for them to do the things that he desires for them to do. You know, the reason why I'm laughing is because, you know, we played in one-on-one -on -one like three times. And yeah. I can see the progression and, you know, I see the moves you be doing. You know, you cut me with like two or three curls over today. And, you know, I'm just amazed by the way you, you improve, you know. And, you know, I, I appreciate the work that we both getting at the gym. Yeah. Because I feel like you're getting better, making me want to get better, you know. So I, I, you're not only learning from me, I'm learning from you, you know. Now all the moves that I do is all calculated because you know you you're a quick, strong, athletic you know guard. So now I gotta find a way like to shoot over you, to go over you, and you know uh, I gotta thank you for that because I'm enjoying every moment that you know we've played and been in the gym together. And you know, but now that you have all the, this experience, um, you know, talk about your your college career and. Um, what do you aspire, aspire to, you know, become on the basketball court? And then you can't even talk about what you aspire to become outside of the basketball court because, you know, we're, we're human beings and we're, so we play a sport, but we are a human being. And a sp basketball is just an outlet. It's, a, it's something that we do. And, of course, we want to get paid for it. But there's also another thing called life, and you know. That's right. <laughs> so you gotta right. you gotta tell me what you want to do in life outside of basketball, you know. So you know you can't elaborate on that. I would say on the basketball court, even my even my motives changed. I wanted to be the best player everyone's seen. Now I just care about reaching the goals that Tayshawn wants to reach. So. When I wake up, I'm thinking, okay, how can I get better? As a basketball player, it's something that I enjoy and I love doing. Last year, 
when I was in high, even when I was in high school, it was way worse. It was what kind of platform can I put myself on? Like I didn't even if I had a bad game, but I felt that maybe I did a, a nice move, or maybe that was captured and put on got on camera, and you know, it made it on YouTube or someone shared it. I thought those things were more important than how I actually play, and that's terrible. And I'm like, sometimes I even got to the point where I'm like, if there's a camera in front of me, then I ought to play better. And that's wrong. It's like now when I get on the court, I respect the person in front of me and I appreciate the opportunity to play the game I love another day. So whenever I play, it's might as well just give my best. You know, that's what Kobe would say. Kobe say, might as well give your 100% if you're doing it or just or, or zero. It's either 100 or zero in everything that I do. And on the basketball court, for me, I've worked so hard for my skills, and I'm, there's so much more skills, so much more levels for me to get to, milestones that I can reach. But the mental game is something that I lacked, and I want to really get smarter and see myself take the steps and progress to play the game differently. So I want to see myself as an intelligent basketball player before I'm done dribbling the basketball. And when I'm done dribbling the basketball, life, it's, I know there's so much more things ahead of me that I'm going to enjoy and I'm going to love because with the opportunity I have to go in and play this game, I can go into everything with the same attitude, the same energy, this everything I learned from basketball is making me into a man. You know, my focus, sharpening my listening skills, me being attentive, me being learning how to be a, a leader. All these things are really important. Having composure, knowing how to switch from a nice guy to a person who is ready to win. And not always being passive. And I feel that me down the line, sports is something that's led me into doing film. People didn't know if I've never played basketball, I would have never been a person that is, you know, an upcoming filmmaker. So I see that I can take different things from this game and how it's just changing my life completely. I can see you as the next Spike Lee. <laughs> I can see you also as, a, as the next Westbrook, you know, so <laughs> the possibility is... Uh, I, I appreciate that, like, a lot, and, like, bro, like, you, like, you are 10 years, matter of fact, I'll put more years on that, because I'll say you're 12 years, like, beyond where I am today, so... For you to appreciate being in the gym with me, like that doesn't make any sense to me, but it just, you know, it shows me how humble you are and it makes me begin to think, okay, you know, if I'm learning from you, then I should be progressing more. I should be working harder. And when it's a younger kid, I should be giving back, you know, and telling him about how much I appreciate his enthusiasm, his work ethic, and anytime he's able to score or even even beat me you know so which a young kid won't beat me you know but <laughs> he might get close so and you know so the other things that I'm seeing and I'm learning that I can take from you that's what's up um, you know I, I'm you know 30 and I come from a different generation you know but it's funny that you said that you know every time the camera was there you would play nice or even though you played a bad game, but you did like two or three highlights that you would be happy, you know. That's something that, you know, certain people wouldn't understand, like, because, you know, y'all got cameras all over your face, like, every time. So, like, you know, um, why do you think that now kids, they only worry about cameras and that one moment? And when you look at the scoreboard, you're like, they haven't done anything. <laughs> it, it because, man, like, it's social media. When kids are looking for who has the best mixtape, for who has the most followers, for who has the most clout. So if someone, if you are a good basketball player and 
maybe you're reaching your personal goals, but you're not popular, then you've missed out on half of what is so important today. And kids want to feel like they're the best basketball player. They don't always have to be the best basketball player. They kids care more about signing off to a Division One school than actually playing there. <laughs> and you know, it might hurt, it'll definitely hurt them that they're not playing. But when they look back on their phone and they got ten thousand followers and their DMs are blowing up and they can just take a picture with the jersey on and post it, then okay, I I accomplished one of my goals. But you know, the, it's just not enough. When social media before that and you before YouTube was in the game, then no one would have known about a kill card, Seventh Woods. You know, they were Andrew Wiggins. That's a bigger name, but he wouldn't have been as exposed globally. Um, probably until at least he went to college. They would have known about him because he was just that big of a player. You know, you would have known about a player like that, right? But seeing a mixtape on him every week that made him a thousand times more relevant in everyone else's life kids want to feel that relevant they want to see their name somewhere they want to see their name in someone else's face through an electronic rather than seeing their name on a sheet with 25 35 points or 10 assists or X amount of blocks beside it. So that's what matters. It's it's the face. So what would you say the state of basketball in Toronto? Huh? What would you describe it as? Where do you think it is now compared to before? Where do you think it's heading? Do you think it's going in the right direction? Do you think that, you know, because of social media, players that people think they're good, they're not really that good? What, what good, would yeah. you say... Is happening in Toronto right now. In Toronto, see, I'm just kind of getting back into it. I was kind of out, but I would say in terms of what's happening is kids definitely have opportunity. The Division One kid that didn't make Division One five years ago is going to Division One now and doesn't have to leave Canada. So they're making those moves, and they have people that are behind them, organizations that are behind them. They have the resources and the connects. And they have the trainers, right? So I would say that's the difference that's, that's been going on with Toronto. So do you think it's better or it's just more connected? Both. They have the, they, they have the more teams. They have a lot of... They, now we've went from high school to prep. Mm -hmm. Everyone's in prep. So they have organizations that are focused more around basketball. Kids can play basketball more. They can develop more and they can be exposed more too. So they're in a much better position. There's, and it, it just, I just see it as being a stronger foundation for these upcoming basketball players. The talent, I always see the talent, you know, we had, always had guys coming out. Yeah. But in terms of, I just see so much more kids playing in bigger stages. And it's, um, it's almost like we multiply the amount of basketball players we had now. Mm. That I wouldn't. I don't know if that's true, but where I'm seeing kids playing in all these Puma events, Nike events, those kids are playing on their local rep teams, like Scarborough Blues, mm. Mississauga Monarchs, House League. Now these kids are going out to sponsored events, and they don't have to be an exceptional player. Mm. It's better for them though. That makes me happy. Yeah, I mean, we all benefited, you know. Um, you, you know, like being mm -hmm. from the the West End, uh, you know. You know, I just came here and people was telling me I thought Toronto was like united, but apparently, Toronto is not that united. Uh, no, not at all. Definitely not. It's divided. Mm -hmm. Can you speak more about that? Why is it divided? Uh, how can we make it like united? That's a that's a really tough one. I don't have the answer to it. Division. It's really tough being able to find unity, but what I try to focus on is 
taking it one person at a time, one one city at a time, one neighborhood at a time, and doing the best that I can. Mm. You know, being able to bring the unity. There's it's so complicated in terms of what's happening, and the biggest challenge is that when people find themselves doing the right things, they end up getting more divided from their surroundings because everyone is still in the same mentality. Mm. Whether that's the poverty mentality, gangs, you know, just they have that ceiling on top of them. And as simple as it is to remove that ceiling because of everything they've experienced they learned, it just becomes that much more different and they really need a source, a foundation that's transformational. The way that I had that that foundation and that source. So I would say that you know, doing what I can, that's the only response that I would have to a question like that. Friend, for you, for Montreal, have you seen any changes? And if and if not, what would you do, or what do you want to do to make a change? Montreal is in a better state right now. Um, you know, um, there's a lot of good players, a lot of great players coming out. I feel like in a couple years it's gonna be the the jewel of Canada. Wow, it's uh, crazy. I'm talking about for yeah. the infrastructure and. The mentality too, like. Yeah. Okay, I got you. I got you. And the people that was uh, in power before, mm -hmm. they're less relevant. And those person that was in power before mm. wanted the the kids or the youth to go to like the Canadian university. That would be like their end goal, and that would be like we made it. Now you have different people from different background, different mentality, and they're like, nah. We're not going to deal with that. We don't want to send you to a French university and it's it's done. No, we're going to teach you how to speak English. We're going to help you with the SAT. Wow. We're going to send you to college and we're mm. going to make you want to go to the MBA, you know. So, you know, so Montreal is where it's at now. It's in the, you know, we got three guys in the MBA right now. We got... Uh, Chris Boucher, Lugans Dort, and Ken Birch. And, you know, there's a few more coming up. We got guys in Europe doing big things, you know, Kenny Sherry and, you know, Kim Yose playing in uh, the NBLC. And, you know, I feel like what's happening now should happen, should have happened 10 to 15 years ago. Got you. There was a lot of talent. There's so many names I can name. And, because those guys wasn't uh, helped, it made it 10 to 15 years later. You know what I'm saying? So, That's right, yeah. You know, now I see the kids, they're already thinking about coming to Ontario, coming to the States. They're not, they're not in the bunk mentality that, oh, we, if we make it in Quebec, we're good. No, it's mm -hmm. like, now it's more of a global vision. And uh, I feel like politics, what, what was going on in politics in Quebec, was going downwards to the people, but that's right. Now we yeah. awoken, and we're like, nah, we're Canadian. We gotta be, you know, seeing the whole picture, not just our own province. And if we make it here, we're good. So I feel like now, you know, the state of Montreal is way better. We got a lot of basketball players now coming out. We have a lot of. You know, old guys coming back, helping. I'm helping uh, through Pro Performance Plus. Always going back to my high school, and so that the, the high school kids now um, they're looking at me and they're working out with me. That's a blessing. You 15, 16, and you, you play with a pro that went Division One. What else can you you know want? Like you know now guys, you know they have all the outlets possible. They even call me for whatever thing they need. Like, I got young boys, you know, they know they can count on me. Like, you know what I'm saying? So that's something that I'm proud of. I'm proud of Montreal. And, you know, just the, the visibility of basketball in Quebec, it's 
tremendous. Even, let me tell you something. <laughs> uh, TS, I got a lot of stuff about basketball in Montreal, man. So we got TSN, but the French version. Really? Yeah. Wow. They just started showing basketball last year, man. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. They would put curling on the French TSN. And we would be like, what's... I remember, like, Kijana 10 years ago, I would send, like, an email practically, like, for a month every day, like, we should put basketball, we should put basketball. And then they saw that our Canadian team on the NHL wasn't going to the playoffs. And they're like, oh, we got a hole in the network. That's when they started like piggybacking on the, the Raptors. So now you got a lot of people, you know, tuning in to basketball just now. So just to tell you how backward things was and with little, how we did a lot. So what we're going to get that a lot It's gonna explode, so and we still got ways to go. And that's that's why me, you know, I wake up every day, I got a smile in my face because I know like it's only gonna get better, you know. That's right. Lord. Thanks for tuning in. I appreciate your time. Hopefully you liked it. So tune back in next time. <laughs>